welcome March 10th discussion group. We're on a new topic tonight and um, I'm excited to talk about, this is a foundational topic about what, what the church is, what we're supposed to be doing, who we are, how do we know, who defines it, all, all kinds of questions. So um, I should have asked before I started recording if anybody would like to open with prayer. But I can edit out the long silence as I wait for somebody to volunteer. <laughs> volunteer. Oh, thank you, Carol. <laughs> no editing required. Okay, go ahead, Carol. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thanking you for the wonderful God you are, thanking you for your loving care with us. We invite you to meet with us this evening. Help us to understand with open ears and wide eyes. Uh, guide us in the things we need to learn and just bless us we ask in the name of Jesus your son amen 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 thank you I just love hearing your voice Carol it's so soothing um okay so I'm gonna share my screen and um in preparing for this um, tonight we're talking about what is the church and I like that visual. Isn't that great? Um, do you see gray boxes blocking your view or can you see the screen? Mm -hmm. No? Screen. No gray box. Okay, great. Um, I can never I can't really tell from my view my viewpoint. Okay, so I started listing, Mark and I sat down and we made a bunch of questions about the church. And so I'm just gonna read them really fast. Um, as we begin to go into this topic, what is the church? What's the role of the church in the world? What is the purpose of the church? What is our or your role in the church? Where is the church? What church do you go to? Where is your church? How long have you been in a part of a church or the church? When did the church begin? Stephanie, I can send these to you. <laughs> She's trying to write them all down. Um, who is the church? <laughs> How do you become a member of the church who defines what the church is? How does the church organize and lead itself? What does the Bible say about the church? How did the church come to look like it does today? What does God want the church to be doing today? Why church? Does church even matter? And more. <laughs> I put the and more there because we just decided to stop at that point. And so, um, as you can see, there are a lot of questions that surround this this word this one word which carries so much i mean this word is is pretty loaded and um so i i have a video queued up on my other machine but i'm going to go ahead and see if i can find it here real quick uh it's called what is what is church and i've got a couple really short videos so my plan for the night is to show a couple short videos and um to help have you help me create a chart a chart that um where we list what is the church and what is not the church and and i so you can be thinking as you watch these videos if i can just find the right one here there are around 400,000 Christian churches in the United States, and millions more all around the world. Not only are there so many churches, but there are so many people going to those churches. In 2017, nearly 4 in 10 Americans were active churchgoers, and in cities like Chattanooga and Salt Lake, that number rose to 6 in 10. But not only are there so many churches, and not only are there so many people going to those churches, but there are so many different types of churches. Episcopal, Lutheran, Greek Orthodox, Seventh-day Adventists, Catholic churches, non-denominational churches, non-denominational churches that are actually non-denominational and not non-denominational that has actually become its own denomination. Whoa. And yet when Sunday rolls around, you'll hear the vast majority of people say the same exact thing. I'm going to... 
If you look at our lives as Christians, this is how many of us define church. A physical building that we go to once a week for music, Bible teaching, and mediocre coffee. And yet, if you ask people for their definition of church, you'll often find yourself in a much deeper conversation. The church is the house of God, a group of worshipers. It's a community. It's not a building, it's people. So which one is it? And why is it that for so many of us, our intellectual definition of church is very different than our practicing definition. Well, it shouldn't surprise us that the word church is found all over the Bible. It's used in numerous books by numerous writers. Luke uses it, John uses it, Paul literally writes letters to churches. Even Jesus talked about his church several times throughout the Gospels. If we look specifically at the New Testament, the word used most often for church is the word ecclesia. It's used 118 times in the King James Version, 115 times as church, and three times as assembly. And that's how most people define ecclesia, an assembly. However, if we actually take time to break that word down a bit, we actually get a much deeper understanding of what a biblical church is. The word ecclesia is made up of two root words. Ek, meaning the point from which action proceeds. Ek is like the starting line of a race or the launch pad at NASA. It's a home base, but not one that is meant to be stayed at. The second part of the word is kaleo. Kaleo is not a mix of keto and paleo. The college version of John was very disappointed when he found that out. Kaleo is a verb meaning to call or invite by name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul writes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. We see here that church and calling are intimately tied together for those of us who follow Jesus. So ecclesia, or the biblical church, is the assembly of God's people called and invited by name to action. Notice how we said the assembly, not an assembly. The biblical church is not just a gathering. It is the continual assembly of God's people being called by name to active faith in Jesus. Pastor Jeff Vanderstelt says that the church is the people of God, saved by the power of God, for the purposes of God in the world. So next time you show up to church, remember, this is just one gathering that is part of the gathering that God has called all believers to take an active part in. Okay, so um, there are all kinds of videos out there and I just chose a couple and um, just tried trying to give kind of a couple different angles to look at it. Um, any comments on that one before I see if I can? Um... Great video. Anybody else want to say anything about just what he said? We're, we're going to get more into like what God wants the church to be doing and how does he know who the church is and, and other words for the church. No other comments? Okay. So right, let me see if video. I can open. It was, it was informative. Okay. All right. Well, let me show you this one to get into picking apart things and putting things back together. The first one just I went so fast, you can, couldn't absorb it all. <laughs> yeah, he did. Oh, that's the way video does these days. He talked synchly. I mean, you know, I could understand everything. It wasn't, you know, a blur or something, or I had to. Right. Uh, hard. All right. Yeah, you can. I'll send you the links if you want to watch it again. Um, all right. Here we go. big question for us today is what is the church and what is the church supposed to do? Well, throughout the ages we've had different ideas about this. Uh, some people think that the church is like this a building, an institution where God is way up above us and you have to go through the church to get up to God. So we try to bring people into this institution out of the darkness and into God. Other people realize that the church is actually people, but we still have this idea that God is up there 
and that people gather inside of this building called the church in order to praise and worship God so that we can look up to God. And we realize that there's other people in the world. And so our idea of the church is that these people that are in darkness need to come into the church. So we come up with all kinds of ways to try to attract people to come into the church so that they can somehow reach up to God. But what if we thought about it like this? God sent Jesus to be a human, to live among a particular group of people called the church, to reveal who God is among the people. But the Spirit of God is everywhere at work in the world. In all people, all across the world, God is working with them and drawing them in order so that they can know Jesus. And so the church, in the power of the Holy Spirit, is called to go into the world, to interact with our neighbors and our friends so that we can all learn who Jesus is. Now, of course, this group of people called the church, they need a place to meet, they need a place to gather, and so buildings and things like that are important and part of the process. But we need to remember that the church is a group that is gathered around the body of Jesus and then sent to love the neighbor, to be the hands and feet of the neighbor. Like Jesus told us, as you are going, make disciples of all people. We are the gathered and sent body of Christ to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. All right, any thoughts on that one? Any quick comments before I show you my final one? Final one's about that short. Just, it's just beautiful the way it shows, you know, the way he showed what we're supposed to be. What we're, you know. I appreciated the generosity in this one. That's why I chose this one. I, I appreciated that it shows that the spirit of God is working all over the place, not just within the confines of mm -hmm. a special little right. group of people, right? I thought that was pretty cool. Any other thoughts? Okay, I'll show you the last one and then we will um, start a, jump into our discussion. Welcome. In this episode, I want to tell you why real churches are like schools of fish. This is Susie. Her dream is to become a dancer. That's why she joined a dance school. This is Norm. His dream is to not become dinner. That's why he joined a fish school. As you can see, Susie's idea of school and Norm's idea of school are very different. That's why they don't understand each other whenever they talk about school. Susie wonders, how can they call it a school of fish when they don't even have a building? And Norm wonders, how can they call it a school of dance when it doesn't even move from place to place? The confusion comes from using one word with two very different meanings. When Susie says school, she means a place, a program, an organization. When Norm says school, he means something more like a swarm, a herd, or a flock. When Susie and her friends graduate, their school will still be intact because their kind of school has an existence apart from its members. But when Norm and his friends go their separate ways, their school will dissolve. Without Norm and his friends, their school doesn't even exist. One word, two very different meanings. The same can be said of the word church. In fact, Here's one of the first Christians. We'll call him Max, and we'll put him over here on Norm's side because Max's concept of church is very much like Norm's school of fish. Max's church is fairly small, mainly just his family and a handful of friends and neighbors. They meet almost every night at his house, and it's very informal. Max loves his church and often refers to them simply as his family. Now let's bring in Ed, Ed is one of today's Christians. He doesn't think his church is all that big, but it's far too big to meet in a living room. That's why they own a church building. They also have a small paid staff and volunteers who run the various youth programs and Sunday school classes. But here's where things get really interesting. If you ask Ed whether he thinks the word church describes a group of Christians 
somewhat like Norm School of Fish, or an institution attended by Christians, somewhat like Susie's School of Dance, his answer might surprise you. Many Christians like Ed think they think about church in the exact same way Max does, but they don't. And the way they use the word church proves this. Just listen to some of the ways today's Christians use the word church. What church do you go to? What time does church start? Look at that beautiful old wooden church. In each instance, the church is something separate from themselves. It's an institution. What church do you go to? Or an event. What time does church start? Or a building. Look at that beautiful old wooden church. You could easily replace their use of the word church with Susie's use of the word school. What school do you go to? What time does school start? Look at that beautiful old wooden school. But if you tried to substitute Max's term of affection for his church, it would actually sound kind of crazy. What family do you go to? What time does family start? Look at that beautiful old wooden family. It simply doesn't make sense. Okay, so school. One word with two very different meanings. Church, a word that had only one meaning until we gave it another. If you like this video, please check out the rest of my blog at churchanarchist.com. I like that. All right. And that's kind of a great launching point for our discussion. Um, I thought that was great. I got a kick out of, look at those old wooden people, <laughs> old wooden family. <laughs> so um, any thoughts on the, on, the, on the videos before I go to... Um, our discussion on what is what is a church and what isn't a church. Carol, you said you like that. You like that video? A lot. <laughs> okay, I will share my Word document. And um, Mark, help me make a list of things that the ways that the church has been described. Ecclesia, called out ones, which you heard in the video or ecclesia, uh, the body of Christ, people of God, the temple of God, a gathering assembly of God's people, um, Christians working in the world, a local community of believers, a building, a place of gathering, bride of Christ, a flock of sheep, children adopted by Abba or Abba. Um, so this is where I want your um, participation. And I want to, I got to see your faces. There they are. Okay. So after listening to all that, giving you some time to think, what are some things that would define what the church is? And I mean church here as the called out ones, uh, called to action. I think on that first video, they he used the term um, set apart um, people be that believe that are called to action. So it's as Jesus, Jesus intended. I'm not talking about the corrupted church. I'm talking about what church is supposed to be and then what church is not. So um, like for instance, on here, we might put what church is, which has been said a bunch of times is, is it's the people, right? It's people. Um, and what church is not is a building, right? So I will open, feel free to go ahead and just either wave your hand at me or unmute your mic and say something. And let's just get into um, the first part of this discussion on what the church is, what is it really, and then what it's not. And then we can get into um, some scriptures in the, in the New Testament, Old Testament, about where we see this word used and what we're supposed to be doing, what, what's really on God's heart when he created the church. So, any, and, and no answers, uh, too simple or too complicated so just feel free to shout out some things what the church is what the church is not i think the church is more of a place where because we're so spread out that we uh need a place like he said a, a large place where we can all come together uh so i think the church is still the people but because of 
how spread out we are, we need uh, a centralized place where we all can meet together and commune together. And I still think that it's a family because that's what families do. Uh, families have family reunions. They, they get together, they find a, a central location where everybody can come mm -hmm. uh, from all around the world and join the family and have a gathering together. I think that that in itself is the church. So um, I just think that the, the reason for quote, the building itself is just to have a centralized location where everybody can join together and celebrate God. Thank you, Janice. And I think we all use this term interchangeably. We know when we say, hey, meet, meet me at the church, that we don't mean that's the true church. I think we know that's just the building where, where the church meets. But, but I, you know, we also know that there are a lot of churches or organizations that have made the buildings really, really important. And they've spent a ton of resources time. Um, then they, they kind of get married to the mortgage payment and then they make decisions because based on keeping that building going, that maybe um, could have been, the money could have been used for other things. So um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. If your church is bigger than your living room, then you gotta get a bigger building. I mean, uh, even our tiny little church probably wouldn't fit in our living room very well. And so, um, so we are looking at meeting in a building. So, you know, it, it's not that that's a terrible, sinful thing, you know, it's just, um, what are you, what are we married to and what's controlling our decisions? So, um, okay. Anybody else? What the church is and what the church is not? Oh, Carol. I would add that assembly of people, uh, an assembly that gather together are like-minded people. Okay. And you have to have that in common to <clears throat> worship God and to learn his ways. Uh, so, okay. so gathering to worship. I, I think if, if uh, Carol's, Carol's okay with the clarification, I think spiritually, spiritually like-minded. Okay. That's a good clarification. Because um, because we can have many many different opinions on different things. That's, that's what I meant. <laughs> yeah. When I said to get together to worship. Yeah. Or that's and to learn. Yep. Good. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, Sierra. Uh, the church is um a place for service and supporting one another and not a business. That's good. Awesome. So I guess I could actually put that over here. <clears throat> it's not, church is not a business. Although it many, many times is run like one, even structurally. Um, you don't, you don't really see a lot, you know, and obviously we are not in the first century in the Middle East. So we, we're not going to be exactly like the New Testament church, but you do see some principles there. And we, we don't see a lot of hierarchy. You do see a little bit. I mean, you see Paul overseeing his men, the, the, his mentees, the people he mentored. But, um, you know, really they were, I think it was just so spirit led that they were just gathering in homes and sharing food and resources and reading and praying. And it, it was a much more organic kind of a thing. It was a much more organic society. I mean, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they didn't have airplanes and cell phones and that kind of thing. So, you know, it's, I like how the first video did say that just remember wherever you do worship, that's not the church. It's, it, he, had a, he had some generosity there at the end to, and, and I, I kind of feel that way. I feel like we need to have some grace to say a church can meet under a tree you know um in south america or it can meet in an air-conditioned building in north america it and it's not wrong or right it's just are we pursuing in the call that he's given to the church because if it's just to make ourselves comfortable and feel good and and be with people that think like us well may, maybe we're missing something you know 
Um, and it's okay to get together with people that are like you so that you can go out, um, being sent, um, being, being called and sent. So any other, any thoughts you want to add to the, the list? I know this is something we've talked. Oh yeah, Carol. Another thing to add to what's not, it's not a club. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that brings to mind, um, it is inclusive. It's not exclusive. Yeah, good, good. That's good, Claire. Yep, I think that's what Jesus intended, definitely. Which that that opens a whole can of worms about about what that looks like, you know. Any anything else? Um, I'm gonna add. I'm gonna add that the church, as it was intended, is supposed to be an expression of God's love. Um, incarnate you know we're supposed to be we're supposed to be the hands and the feet the mouthpiece of of God's grace and love and generosity and often that is not the case um, often the church is um boy I'm not sure how I would word it busy judging the world you know I don't know if, what column for that um I think on what a church is not is it's not an idol. Oh, that's good. We tend to do that with people and ideas and it it just causes mess. It's, it's not an idol. Wow, that's really good stuff. I mean, that's true. We we idolize some of these pastors and worship teams like they're celebrities, you know. You know. And, and it's not that you can, you could go to a big church and have a really charismatic speaker who's great. Um, the idolization happens in your heart. It's whether or not you just see him as a person who has a role to play or whether you see, you know, you, you idolize that, that person. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I think also that uh, church, what the church is not. Yeah, I need to put it over here. Yeah. Same with exclusive. I put, yeah, I did put, oh, I didn't. You're right. I didn't put that over there. Okay. Yes, Janice. I think there's a lot of people uh, have prestige uh, to, to belong to a certain church. Uh, yeah. That's I, I, I'm probably not saying it correctly, but you know, like um, I'm a I I go to the First Baptist Church of you know whatever that that's like a uh, a prestige like that's you know higher than something else you know I don't know but it's just like that's like that's the highest one I'm in the best church ever or something like that right 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 so, um. Uh, I, I, form of pride. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but, um, or making an idol of, yeah. 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 I'm not sure how to word that either, but go you know, idol. yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people think that, you know, if they go, well, I'll just use, use us as a, a you know, an example, cause I don't want to say about anybody else's church. Well, I go to Cornerstone and Lemon Grove. Well, you know, I don't go to the one in Spring Valley, you know, that type of thing. Usually when we introduce ourselves, we're like, I'm from Cornerstone, not the big one. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's um, because if somebody asked me and I say Cornerstone, oh, you mean, no, not that oh, one. Oh, <laughs> I know that one. No, no, no. <laughs> um, oh, Sierra, do you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, uh, the, um, I would say the church is, should be um, uh, a place of healing and acceptance um the church is not a place for assimilation and indoctrination did you say indoctrination yeah yeah 
Yes, I totally agree with that. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to figure ahead. out how to phrase this idea because it seems contradictory, but uh, the, the church is not uh, our identity. Our identity is being part of the church, part of the body of Christ, but the church itself is not our identity. So being First Baptist is not our identity. Our, our identity is being part of the body of Christ. First Baptist is a, a, a way or cornerstone. I, I'll take, I'll take Dennis's route and be, be nicer. <laughs> uh, cornerstone um, is, it's, a, it, it's a, a way that we're be, being a, a part of the body of Christ, but it's not the uh, primary identity. The, our primary identity is a part of the body of Christ. I don't know how much sense that makes. I was trying to figure yeah. out how to word it exactly. Yeah, I, I was having, to, I think I have it in the right column. I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, the church as Jesus intended it. I mean, if you use the body of Christ as the definer of what the church is, then that is our identity in the sense that we belong. But, um, but yeah, as a, as a, as a, especially in our Western mindset, as an organization or denomination, it's not our identity. That's good. Very good. Paul talks about Christ who is our life. So that is in a sense the same thing. Yeah, so um, the church is, I'm, I'm going to put Stanley's always saying this. The church is in Christ. Um, and I'm going to put um, the church is, is a, a place to practice the one another's there's there's like i don't know 20 30 one another's in the new testament um and obviously we want to practice those outside the church too but it says you know by this shall men know that you're my disciples if you love one another and mm -hmm. there's love one another serve one another esteem one another better than yourself um you know all those kinds heal one another pray for one another the church is also supposed should be christ-centered yeah. So I think that's what you were trying to say in Christ. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Christ centered. He, he is, we're in him. He's, he's in us. It's, um, oh, you know what else I'm going to put here? It, um, is, uh, I'm going to say the church is, is about relationships, relationship with God and relationship with each other. That's more, that's the family, you know, the school of fish. It's, it's about the relationships. And when I think of Cornerstone, I never think of our building, partially because we don't own a building. <laughs> so it's like, I always think of you guys. I think of the people. And um, when I say I love Cornerstone, that's what, that's what I love. And, you know, in a way we're, we're blessed to be uh, free of no mortgage and no contract. And we could meet in the park. We could meet, you know, in a living room. We could meet in a backyard. Um, we're free to to move and flow wherever God calls us to move and flow. And I love that. Um, so across from about relationships, we could put not clicks. Okay. Oh yeah. Clicks. It's not. I think, clicks. I think Cornerstone is like our last name. Uh, instead <laughs> of, you know, uh, we're the Cornerstone family. Like, you know, I belong to this I like family or the Hauser family. I'm, the Cornerstone is our, is our family name. I like it. Paul talks about the household of God. Household of God. Um, I'm, I'm backtracking a bit, but I, I'm ruminating on the, uh, the identity part of it. Okay. And, and just thinking that it, Given current climate, it might be worth saying that when we make something like what church we're in, our identity, all that does is cause division. It's not healing whatsoever. We we currently do that with politics. It's called identity politics. We say, I am this or I am that, and it causes division immediately for no reason. Good observation. Um, 
Yeah, it's interesting. This morning I ran a, a clergy uh, meeting on Zoom for what started out as a bunch of pastors getting together just to hang out um, and, and do the crosswalk once a year. And then um, as Jim Weeble entered our midst and we started getting more informed on what was going on in the city, um, we started getting involved, you know, doing city cleanups and praying for the city and realizing that there was sex trafficking going on and, and being part of all kinds of things. And that's when I got really involved because that's where my heartbeat is, is to make a difference in our city. And um, I noticed, <laughs> this is an interesting observation, but I've noticed that the more people that I have coming into the group because they love that meeting, uh, they're like the city manager, the sheriff, the crime prevention specialist, the um, somebody whose church is against trafficking, like all these different people come to our meeting and less and less pastors are coming. And I thought that was, it's just an interesting observation. Um, but the ones that come, I will say, are very open to, we've got people from the Baha'i faith. We have Catholics, Mormons, Baptists, um, but we, we are all about being open and inclusive and, um, and linking arms with, every, with, with people and making a difference in our city. And some people have come to me privately and said, oh, you know, should we let the, should we let the Mormon in? You know, it's like, and it's so funny because you, if you know Mark and I, you know what our answer was. Well, yeah. I mean, they want to cut, what, why would we let an atheist in and not a Mormon? I mean, come on, you know, I mean, I don't know what the beliefs are of our city manager, but she loves being there. And today she, she gave us a prayer request. I don't know what her faith is, but, um, so we have, and then when the Baha'i faith came in, it's like, oh, Baha'i faith, you know, it's just, I don't know, Christians, we, we tend to get, I don't know, we get weird about things like that. And so because Mark and I are unofficially in charge it's turned into this very inclusive place of, of a lot of things that I see on the left-hand column um, and, and not clickish. And we haven't drawn lines about, you know, oh, you can be in and you can't be in. And, and you know, honestly, if they read my statement of beliefs, they probably wouldn't let me in. Because <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a very big, generous view of what the church is. I, I think that... Um, I think Jesus has already died for everybody, and some of them may not agree with that. So, um, okay, any other thoughts here on this, our little chart? I do. Yes. Pretty okay. Yeah, mother. Joan. Joan, hello, Joan, have, Joan mother. Have, have you heard the song by VeggieTales called One Lord? No. Well, I'm going to send it to you, and okay. I don't know if you want to play it tonight, but it's it goes through all the names of all the different denominations and combines them together. It's a riot. And at the end, it's like, it's one Lord. And we don't need all this, you know, this division of all these different groups. But uh, so I just emailed it to you. And uh, so you can, you know, listen okay. to it later and maybe play it next time we meet. That sounds good. You know, one thing we haven't listed on here is anything about um, taking care of the poor, um, lifting up the oppressed. Um, Mark's going to be talking about that in his sermon this week. So I don't know. I, I think um, I think that's part of what what Christ has called us to do is to to. I don't think I don't ever think we were supposed to be like in power and. Um, lording over and being part of the system i think we've always the church has always been kind of the oppressed reaching out to the oppressed you know what i mean and um and lifting up the others and uh, i don't know how to say this um i'll just say i'll just say caring for the other and that includes all kinds of stuff um this week mark's going to talk about a passage in deuteronomy and the um where where the people of God were commanded to care for the aliens and the foreigners and the, and, um, and, and welcome the men and the third tithe year and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be very good. Mm, we're studying James. 
And James says, true religion. Yes. None defiled before God is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction when they're having troubles and to keep himself uh, unspotted from the world. And, uh, it's to help people. Perfect. Perfect. The fathers. <laughs> the, oops. Uh, uh, Carol had a comment too. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I can't see everybody's faces on my screen. I have to scroll. Yes, Carol, go ahead. I don't know exactly how to phrase this, but in a way, the church is invisible. The true church is invisible. Only God knows who they are. They're all over the world. They're in different mm -hmm. denominations and different races. And and I don't know what better word. It, it, invisible isn't quite right. <laughs> Can't see the boundaries of it. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. I mean, great point. We, we can walk salty. by that, that homeless guy on the corner who's got the sign and we're judging him because, you know, he's too lazy to work or whatever, you know, however we are in, in, as Americans. And he could be, it could be a child of God sitting right there doing church. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Good point. What would you say, Stanley? They're salty, like we're salt of the earth. There's not much, the salt is not the main ingredient, of, but it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Okay. I know this isn't totally complete, but I think it gets us, it launches us off the ground. Um, let me scroll down and just go through a couple things. And then um, if you have comments, just wave at me or, or unmute and say something. Um, so I, I put together a bunch of stuff from different sources. Um, in the New Testament, the word, of course, you know, is ecclesia or ecclesia. And um, the Strong's Concordance defines that word as assembly, congregation, church, whole body of Christian believers. And he said, what, in the King James, it was 118. Um, yeah. In this source, it said 114. So we already went through all that. Okay, so I looked, I was really scouring the Old Testament to find where, if church was used. And I actually found it in Genesis 28. Um, the word is in Hebrew is, I can't say it, but chal or something like that. And, um, and in, when it's, when that is translated into Greek, it's actually Ecclesia or the church. And it's when Abraham's grandson, Jacob, um, uh, when it was God promised to him that he would make 12 sons into a harmonious worshiping community of nations. So that's the first place I see it. And of course you could actually go back to Adam and Eve. I put this bullet point in there. And say that they were created to worship and fellowship and be in relationship with God. And that was church right there, you know. Um, and that they, they were set apart for that. And of course, there's a whole, you know, whole line of worshipers and people who worshiped other gods also after that. Um, and after the exodus from Egypt to the kingdom of Mount Sinai, Mark used the scripture a couple weeks ago about being his treasured possession, kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So... Um, and I didn't trace through the whole Old Testament. I just didn't have the time. But in the New Testament, the word church appears three times in the Gospels. All of them are in Matthew. So there are words that Jesus said, um, obviously, in the Gospels. So this scripture we went over in our living room when we were going through the harmony of the Gospels, if you remember. And we spent some time on it. It's um, in Caesarea Philippi and uh, it just, I think it was just, they'd just gone through the transfiguration and they're standing up there like the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And we looked at maps and everything. And Jesus says to Simon, you know, who do you say that I am? And he says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And, and then he tells him right there, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples to go out and not tell anybody who he was, which he did a bunch of times. Um, and, and this is so interesting. We talked about this in our living room and I'll, I'll show you. This is the gate of, this is the gates of Hades right here. You have always wondered where, where hell was, right? This is it. So we got to, this is actually at the fountainhead of the Jordan River. And um, this cave was 
dedicated to the, the God of Pan or Pan God. And um, they called it the gates of Hades. And, and there was a waterfall that ran out and they believed, um, I look at my notes. Um, so this was nicknamed the Grotto of Pan. And um, they did all kinds of, of temple worship there. And they believed that at this mouth of this cave, that the gods would come in the winter and they would um, go to and fro through the water and they would return to the underworld and go out in the spring. Um, and so they called this the gates of the underworld. And so here's Jesus. I just think this is so brilliant. He's standing with them at a place where um, the good Jewish people, the good religious people would never be caught dead at this place. Never. Because this was a place of, of sexual immorality, of, of orgies, of um, they would sacrifice children and, and virgins. And like it was... It was a place of just kind of de decadent, you know, uh, just give into the flesh in whatever way, right? Um, and not only that, but but give it all to the God of Pan. And and so here's Jesus, and he's standing here, and he says, even the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. And so um, when you look at, it's like, why would he say that? Why would he stand right here at this place of partying and drunkenness and say this? Oh, here's the Here's the sign that is actually on the outside of, of that cave. It says, this cave is the nucleus beside which the sacred sanctuary was built. In this abode of the shepherd god, pagan cult began early as third century BC. The ritual sacrifices were cast into a natural abyss, reaching the underground waters at the back of the cave. If the victims disappeared in the water, that was a sign the god had accepted their offering. If, however, the signs of blood appeared in nearby springs, the sacrifice had been rejected. So they'd throw people in there and wait to see if they could see their blood. And if they could see their blood in the other springs, then they knew the gods didn't accept their sacrifice. And if they didn't see it, then they assumed they appeased the god uh, of the underworld and they were good. And here's some pictures of Pan. These are the, these are the appropriate pictures. <laughs> There's a lot of inappropriate pictures of, the, <laughs> of, the, uh, of Pan. But any good law-abiding... Uh, rabbi or Jew would never be caught dead there. It's kind of like being right in the heart of Las Vegas or South Beach. And, you know, what stays in Caesarea Philippi, what goes on there stays there, just like Las Vegas. And, and Jesus, he takes the, the disciples right there and, and, and declares Peter the rock of the church. And there was a huge rock there as well when he was saying that. And then he says, the gates of hell won't even prevail against it. So, you know, I mean, we could sit here and conjecture what he might, why he might have done that and what he meant by that. But my guess is that he overcame all of that. Like even the worst decadence, God has already overcome that through and in Jesus, through his life, death and resurrection. So um, let's see. Yeah, I, I wrote, um, here's a place that was cluttered with idols and people making bad decisions where a human heart was aching for God and he walked right in and where the need was the most painful. He wasn't afraid of it. He didn't go, ooh, you know, ooh, got to get out of here. Can't be around sin. You know, he, he walked right in there and said, you know, don't worry. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Um, and the other place that he found, uh, you see church is in, in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, which we also went through in our living room in the Harmony of Gospels, which is about going to your brother, right? If they sin and especially if they sin against you and bringing somebody with you and taking a witness from the church. It's it, a lot of churches use this as the church discipline passage um, or the, you know, go to your brother if they offend you passage. Um, and we, we kind of unpack that at a really deep level. And I have all my notes from that if anybody is interested. So uh, let's see, what are we at? We're, we got about five minutes. So I think I'll stop right there. Um, those are the new, then the apostle Paul uses the word church all the time. And of course it's used in the book of revelation and, um, through John, John wrote about the church, but, um, I think, I think overall, I just realized that, um, we probably could spend one more week on this if you wanted to, because we didn't really like, we kind of just laying a foundation of 
and I think we all pretty much agree on what the church is and what, what the church isn't, but we didn't really get into what we're called to do. And, um, you know, that's the more convicting part is what are we as the church called to do? And we, we, I mean, we give sermons on this topic, so I'm okay if we don't go on, but we can go on. I've got, um, I've got more that we could talk about if you wanted to in two weeks, because next week um, we're taking a break because I'll be out of town. But what do you guys think? And it, feel free to say anything about what we've talked about or the future discussions. I thought Go ahead, Jack. You want to talk one more week about the church? Yeah. What do you think we need to talk about? Because it's such a big topic and I've got tons of research, but what do you think would be helpful in this kind of a format where, where we can hear from each other and look at resources? You know, it's not at church on Zoom. Yeah, you know, it's usually true. one person talking and everybody else listening. And it's, yeah. it's harder when you have 20 or 30 people on Zoom to have a dialogue like this. But I want to give space to have a conversation about this topic if you want it. I have a question. Okay. What does he mean by uh, when he says to Peter, on this rock, I'll build my church? Is, is that, uh, I've heard so many different uh, narratives on that. That's how the Catholic church was built and or started or something like that. So what's, what's your, what's the understanding of, uh, of that phrase? Well, the, the best that I can understand is he was talking to Peter, right? He changed his name right there. And Peter means little rock, I think. Little rock. Um, and and who, who was it that not long after in Acts 2 had the Holy Spirit come upon him and preach to thousands, you know, and, and people were baptized and like, so I think that's what he was referring to was that here you are, you know, Peter, who, who was just like, he was... He was your trouble child, right? <laughs> ADD, you know, he was always up and running and, oh God, you know, I'll do this. I won't do that. And he was just boisterous. And, and he, he's like, I'm going to build my church on you. Um, and I, I, I know the Catholic church took Peter and made him a saint. And, and that's the whole, the papacy, right? The papal and the, the Pope and all that comes from Peter and their belief that the church, um, came from that line and once again that's that's the man-made religion that came out of I think the the first century church and the Roman Catholic Church although I know some lovely Catholics who love Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit as a whole the Catholic Church has used God church religion education oppression um greed all of that stuff to control the masses in a very worldly manner and has been everything but the church you know so yeah joan well i had heard somewhere that he called peter the little rock but he said on this large petra rock i will build the church which would mean himself not yeah peter. and that's probably a better thank you for saying that i forgot about that yeah that's actually a better interpretation when we look at a lot of the gospels a lot of the things that he says he's actually talking about himself when he says salt and light he's talking about himself um and he is he calls he is, himself the rock yeah exactly yeah. he's the just, rock of ages the rock of our salvation the rock of yeah. you know um yeah yeah all through the psalms it does use yeah that he is the rock and you know that's actually he's the one who died for the church for for the body of Christ, actually the whole world. So, um, yeah, Sierra. Um, if if we choose to move forward with the topic, um, I'm not pushing for it. I don't want to. Uh, people want to go to a new thing next week. I'm for the group, um, but um, if we do move on, uh, not, not move on. If we do move forward. Um, uh, I think we should talk about, um, how do I put it? I think we 
should take this time and space to acknowledge the very real like pain and dangers that come out of the church and not in a sense like oh those churches over there but like kind of take a self inventory of our gathering this this um gathering of of, of you know god's hands and feet um to kind of evaluate like like where are we vulnerable to allow pain or um where are we like basically in, in this topic of what is the church i i i my suggestion is to make it personal not ethereal like oh what is, what is the church and what's it supposed to be but what is this church and what is our purpose and and like, how can we be, how can we fit on the left side of that column more perfectly or, or be more aligned with that? Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Um, I don't know if anybody else has a comment. I just got done watching the Black Church um, documentary, three-part series, uh, so good. And looking at the role that the church played um, in slavery when, um, when white churches, white people were enslaving the blacks, they were able, that was the one place they had and they could actually have a voice and opinion and be free. And they would sneak away to these little, um, they called them prayer houses and they were illegal to even have them, but they would sneak away and they would, they would be able to praise and worship. And I mean, it's, yeah, there's a whole history there about the white church and the black church that, you know, we could explore even that is very, um, <laughs> yeah, you talk about taking a self inventory. That's pretty painful when you see the way that um, white man was looking at, at black people and saying, well, they're two thirds of a person. So they will we'll allow them to get saved, but they can't vote. You know, it's like, oh, like I was just, I was really slayed when I watched that whole history. But, but also I was very inspired how God used the church to liberate um i mean where women could actually get up and 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 preach and you know not all not not all of them because that that came a little bit later but um the church was a very powerful institution um in in the freedom of this this of slavery in our country um and i think that's why it's very important to a lot especially still down in the in the south there's a lot of of people that are very protective of their church, you know, and I think that rightly so. But then there's the white church, and, and I don't want to just, you know, I'm not trying to make a, 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 what's that called, a dichotomy, or like not all white churches were oppressive, but um, that is part of our roots and our history. As I was watching, I was very struck by that. So that's one part that we could talk about, and. There are other things that even, you know, in our church, <laughs> our church history within Worldwide Church of God and, and GCI that, that we've been guilty of and, and we've changed a lot, but, you know, we're still an institution with an organization and this hierarchy and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, it, I'm open know, to talking about that. If you guys want to dig in, that's, that's going deep, but, you know, that's, that, this is the place to talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah, Stanley? Paul mentions about some character when you read the epistles you, the churches that had some really bad rascals in there in like the uh, the qualification for a, a, a pastor he's not doesn't do barroom roles or something like that he's not a brawler not, not doesn't pick fights with people uh, uh, and they, he was complaining about somebody who would uh, a lot of people there had committed fornication in one church and had grieved him and uh, all kinds of <laughs> people there. The church is not for not filled with angels. It's bad people <laughs> that have been redeemed by Christ. Yeah, that's all of us, actually. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's a great point, Stanley. Well, what do you guys think? Do you want to talk about this one more week? It would be two weeks from now because I'll be gone next week. Um, 
Mark and I are flying up on Saturday to my dad's and then driving back probably Wednesday or just depends on how his, what Home Depot says. By the way, he, um, he had a great interview with the Home Depot yesterday and his last day at the USPS is Friday. Um, his contract, that's when his contract was supposed to end. And he heard rumblings yesterday that maybe they might extend it, but you know, it's just been four months of not knowing what's going on. He's just kind of done with it. Mm. So, so um, if he gets this job at Home Depot, he'll be five minutes down the street. He'll work 2 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. and get home before midnight, which he hasn't done in four months. Um, so when, when will he know? They, they just said, we'll get back to you soon. So we don't know, but I figure this is, this is a great time. Like they haven't given him a date. So I booked his ticket last night. He's coming with me and I'm going to have him build my dad a, a handrail so he can, doesn't fall down the steps again. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> he said, you just, you just want me to go so I, what I can do for you. I'm like, yeah, pretty much. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we're, I'm looking forward to it. We haven't done a road trip in a long time. So we, it's a 10 hour drive coming this, back. I'm excited this is, about this that. Is, this will be good for the both of you. Sure. Yeah, awesome. he's not, a little getaway in between his jobs. So yeah, yeah so I, I, I'm hoping that he'll have that job. And then in 90 days, we'll have benefits um, covered by Home Depot instead of Cornerstone having to pay for them. It will be a real good thing. So, Will, let's take a little vote. Anybody who wants to continue talking about the church one more, one more week, raise your hand. Okay. Anybody that doesn't want to raise your hand. Anybody that doesn't care, close your eyes and act like you're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually really sleeping. What do you think? Did you raise your hand on any of those? You want to talk? You're sleeping. Okay. You don't care. <laughs> okay. No, nah, it's uh I like these kinds of discussions. I like these topics a lot. Um I'd like to do another week. Okay. I mean <laughs> yeah, I talked a little bit about the black church. Let's talk about what what the Europeans did to uh the people that were living here when they came into Southern California and built all the missions and, and whoo, that's a whole nother thing with the native yeah. Americans and the, the Mexican yeah. people from Mexico. And yeah, so we have a lot to repent of. That's for sure. But yeah, look, look what we did here in America to the, um, what was it? The Japanese or whatever during oh. the war, when we put them, we took their businesses, took their homes and they were citizens and put them in internment camps right here. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. That now that was the government, government but that was the government. That well, I know that. I know that, but that still. Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I agree. It's still an atrocity, and um, they, yeah, yeah, U.S. U.S. citizens and their whole lives were uprooted and yeah, uh, yeah, terrible, and destroyed. Terrible. But you know, I, I think the hard part is you know that we're connected to a history, and we have to be honest about it. Where people have used God. I mean, look at the Crusades, right? People have used God, in the name of mm -hmm. God to murder, to weaponize, to, uh, to use one of Sierra's words, indoctrinate. Um, you know, we, we've even gone around the world and done this too. Like we send missionaries to go people, make people forsake their culture and turn into a European white guy. <laughs> it's like, you know, and you know, a lot of people have repented of that and, and we're learning, but we still have a long way to go. So I like Sierra's suggestion to look, let's look at our church Let's look at ourselves and say, where do we fit in those two columns and, and be honest about the places where maybe we can still grow. And um, there, just so, just kind of closing comment, I know it's 11 after, I've been listening to a ton of podcasts and, and webinars and reading articles about what's happening to the church right now at post COVID. And it's really interesting. There's a lot of forecasters that are saying, the church is about ready to change pretty big right now because of the pandemic. And so, and it's not necessarily a terrible thing. Um, if, if it 
if it can reflect more of the things on the in the left column, right? Um, where where it becomes back more to the organic expression of faith and less about the the power and being right and having power over people mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. But it's it's interesting. I mean, they're saying about one third that across the board that churches will have about one third less attendance when things fully open up. Um, and so then you have to ask the question, is that what it's all about? Is it all about attendance and numbers and numbers and nickels and noses? Yeah, so some big questions to talk about. I'm glad that you're here to talk about them with, because they're important. And, and these kind of things um, lead into our next topic and the topic after that too. So um, for those who weren't on last week, um, we'll be talking about abortion after we finish talking about the church. So um, you can be thinking about that, praying about that, reading about that, bringing your, your uh, thoughts to the table. Um, would anybody like to close this in prayer? It's 813. Sorry to go over a little bit. Oh, Sierra, thank you. <laughs> Jesus, he mutes his camera. <laughs> Way to go, Jesus. <laughs> Just the zoom, the zoom way to hide, right? Right. <laughs> okay. I go. Sorry, my sound went out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, dear God. Um, uh, thank you for church. Um, I know uh, the church. Uh, Thank you for, for, for giving us a way to meet you and, and see you and hear you, whether that be through a conversation or a song or um, reading a scripture. Um, I know a lot of people have experience great joys in the church, but also a great deal of pain as well. Um, but you were in all of it, God, and I thank you for being there. Uh, please uh, be with us as we, um, as we wrestle more with church the, and the ways that you uh, intended to be and push us closer and closer into what your heart is for church, God. And um, pray that we all sleep well and, uh, and uh, pray that we all get vaccinated and uh, things can be normal-ish, soon-ish. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>